All right. So now we are going to switch gears and talk about phase equilibrium. So um, the early part of this, I, I hope some of it is review from other classes, but we are going to get to uh, a new topic of ternary phase diagrams, which will, I think, be new for almost everybody uh, in this class. But I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page um, to start out with. So. Uh, what I want to do, and again, we are in a ceramics class, so I want to talk about ceramics in particular. So I'll start with a, a question for everybody. So this, uh, again, after I sort of give the statement here, uh, pause the video and, and think about this and write the answer down. Um, but try to find some information. Um, the textbook is a good place to start, uh, but look up magnesium oxide and nickel oxide, whatever in information you think will be helpful, and see if you can predict what will happen from a phase equilibria standpoint if we heat these together, right? So some random temperature, we heat them together. What happens when they reach equilibrium? So use whatever information you can find. I would recommend starting with the textbook, but feel free to use the internet uh, as well. And write down what you think uh, is going to happen to these two materials. So I'll give you a chance to, to, to do that. Uh, pause the video and then come back uh, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so the point I'm trying to get across with that exercise um, is about solid solubility, right? So, so solubility we've talked about uh, before. Uh, you've probably talked about it in an MSC 201 uh, in the context of metals. Uh, you've definitely talked about it in the context of liquids, uh, but it can also be true in ceramics. And so when we look at the ideal case right of complete solid solubility we're going to look at a number of factors and these are going to look pretty similar to the hume roth theory rules that you talked about with metals so the four things that we're going to look at are structure so do they have the same structure or are they similar structures uh, valency uh, do they have the same valency um, in, in, in those cases um, the sizes do the ions, cation and anion, are they re uh, reasonably close together so there's no strain? Uh, and so same thing there, the 15% rule that you saw with metals, that's a pretty good rule to start with. Uh, and the fourth is chemical affinity. So this also, um, you don't want the, the differences in chemical affinity uh, for each other uh, to be too high. So you want, basically you need as many things to be similar about these materials um, as possible. So let's take a look at some of the information I gathered for these two materials, uh, magnesium oxide and nickel oxide. So first of all, uh, up at the top here, uh, this is from your book. This is um, the uh, ionic structures. So you'll notice that both of the structures are rock salt. Um, I also, uh, from chapter three, gave you the ionic sizes of those two materials, those two cations. The anions you can assume are, are pretty similar in size because they're both oxygen. Um, I gave you the electronegativities uh, of the elements, and I also gave you valence states for nickel and manganese. Right? So if we look at all these, same structure, uh, the sizes that we have, uh, you know, if they are in the same um, structure the coordination is six so if you look at six on both of these uh, 86 picometers 83 picometers so they're relatively similar in size um, if you look at the electronegativities uh, so we have uh, nickel uh, so let me find it here so uh, 1.9 uh, so 1.9 for nickel and then for manganese uh, we have 1.2 so they're a little bit further apart but the electronegativities are uh, pretty similar. And then if we look down to valence states, we see that nickel can have a lot of different valence states. Um, a lot of those aren't very common, um, but the most common ones that you see are, and really the most common one is two, um, and then the same thing for magnesium. Both of those are two, and they both have the possibility of a plus one. But again, plus two is the most common for both of those. So really, uh, structure is the same, sizes are very similar, electronegativities are within um, uh, seven, and then the valences are the same. And so for, the, for all intents and purposes, we have really good compatibility between these two. And so we could expect that 
um, a large amount of solu solid solubility would happen if we heat these two things up. All right, so here's the actual results. See, so this is what we actually expect to see. This is the phase diagram for magnesium oxide and nickel oxide. And so those are our components, so our end members, so magnesium oxide down here and nickel oxide over here, right? So the, those are the, and then there's variations between those uh, on the x-axis. And then we see temperature here. So uh, if you remember from MSE 201, uh, this type of phase diagram, this binary phase diagram, is an isomorphous system because it has one solid. So here you can see it's a solid solution of magnesium and nickel with oxygen. So rock salt structure and then randomly varying those two materials. So it's isomorphous because we only have one solid and one liquid. And then you have a range of meltings uh, in between there. Right? So this tells us that we do, in fact, have complete solid solubility. So that's the sort of experimental results of what we can expect with these two components. Um, but again, if you remember from 201, these scenarios are, in fact, pretty rare. Complete solid solubility uh, is not very common. It's more of the exception uh, than the rule. And so we're going to look at some other cases having to do with solubility that can uh, determine what type of phase diagram we get. All right, so limited when we have more limited solubility, this is an example of that case. So we have, in this case, magnesium oxide still, but instead of the nickel, we have calcium oxide. And so again, you could go through the same exercise and see uh, how similar these structures, valence, size, are, uh, but we see that in this case we have more limited solubility. And so here, again, this should look pretty uh, familiar from other classes, but this is an example of a eutectic phase diagram. Again, we're in a binary system of these two end members, and then this is temperature up here, and we see we have a eutectic. So this is the eutectic point, right? And then we have the uh, single phase regions for magnesium, and the single phase region for calcium oxide over here. And then in between here, this large region here is uh, a mixture of the two solid solutions. And so instead of having a solid solution, we have a mixture of those two components. So they don't like to mix. And this is what uh, this is one of the things that can happen when we have limited solubility between these end members, the components in the system. All right. Another thing that can happen is when we mix two things. So those, for example, uh, here we have A and B, but the uh, previous examples were magnesium oxide and calcium oxide or magnesium oxide and nickel oxide. So when we mix those two things, uh, another thing that can happen is if they're different enough, they can actually form a new compound. Right? So in this case, we mixed A and B together. And if we mix A and B together, we can actually form a new compound called AB. Right? So you can imagine that that's if you take, for example, uh, gold and nickel, and you mix them one to one, you would have something gold, one, nickel, one. Right? So it's a new compound with a new structure um, that doesn't have the same structure as the other. So in this case, um, this is an intermediate phase, and we call an intermediate phase, uh, this AB, an intermediate phase, because it's not one of the end members. So these are terminal or end members, A and B, because they're on the ends of the phase diagram. That's all we mean by that statement. So intermediate, uh, terminal, or end member uh, are A and B, all right? So in this case, AB that we have, uh, one thing about that is that it doesn't form um, a, sol uh, a solution. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have any solubility. So if I have um, a one-to-one -one mix of A and B, I'll form AB. But if I have any sort of deviation, so if I add just one more atom of B and I go this way, or if I want add just a little bit more of A and I go this way on the phase diagram, I will form a new phase. I'll form alpha on this side or beta on the other side. And so there is no visible 
solid solution range since it's just a line, right? It's just this line here in the middle. And so we call this a line compound when it's just this line, right? So it's pretty aptly named. All right, so a little bit more about this line compound. So when we have this line compound, and if you think about this from going to room temperature, so I start with AB. Let's say I start at AB uh, at room temperature and I heat it up. So I keep heating it up, nothing happens, it's still a solid, it's still a solid. And then I get up to this point right here, right? At that point, below we have solid and above it, we have 100% uh, liquid. Right, so this is like a pure material like nickel or copper. Right, if we heat that, uh, it'll reach its melting point and melt into a liquid. Right, so this type of reaction where we have um, one phase or one solid phase to a liquid and it just doesn't change composition, so it has the same composition. This uh, solid has a composition AB, the liquid has a composition of AB. This is referred to as congruent melting, and that compound is therefore a congruent melting compound. So this, in this case, AB is a congruent melting uh, compound. All right, so now I wanna look at another real example of in one of these intermediate phases. So in this case, it's magnesium oxide and aluminum oxide or alumina and so if we mix these things together, we can kind of see um, that it's a little bit more complex here. Uh, but one thing that we'll see is that we have a phase over here that's ma uh, magnesium oxide and a phase over here towards the edge that's aluminum oxide, right? So those are our in-member or terminal phases. But in the middle here, we have this new thing. We have this pretty large region here that's called spinel. And so this is a new compound that's formed when we mix those things together. So magnesium oxide and aluminum oxide are so different that if we mix them together, we'll actually form a new material. And that material is called spinel. And you've probably, uh, we've actually talked about spinel uh, earlier in the semester uh, as a unique structure that has its own properties. Same thing, that's what we have, have here. And so spinel is an intermediate compound but unlike the previous example, if I go back to the next slide, the last slide, AB was just a line compound, right? There was no region or area to that. Here though, there's a pretty large, oh, excuse me. Uh, here though, there's a pretty large area that's identified as spinel. So this is an intermediate compound, but it's not a line compound because it, it's not a line, right? So this tells me that if I'm in this spinel region, so for example, if I'm right here, so if I have a compound that has this amount of aluminum oxide and this amount of magnesium oxide, if I vary that composition at all, so if I add more magnesium or if I add more aluminum, I can still be in the same region, right? So there's uh, some wiggle room <laughs> so to speak, we can change the composition and still maintain the same structure, right? So there's some variability in the spinel structure, and so that's why this has an area. Whereas the other structure, AB, uh, did not. It was a line, so we couldn't vary that structure without making something new. So in this case, I have to really vary the spinel structure before it forms these other materials like magnesium oxide or aluminum oxide. So that's the difference between those two types of materials. All right, so we saw congruent, an, an example of congruent melting, where we go from a solid to liquid with no change in composition. So as you might imagine, um, we're gonna have some cases where things do change composition. And so the term we use for that is not very creative, it's incongruent. So congruent and then incongruent. And so in this case, the example here, so we have another compound called AB, so it's not the same diagram though. Um, so in this case, if you think about it in the same way, we're heating up AB along this line, so it has a given composition. And then once we get to this point right here, right, that's where it starts to decompose and form a liquid above. And so when we do that, so if we go just above, 
in this region, we can see that we have alpha and liquid, right? So AB goes to alpha and liquid. So AB transforms into two different things, alpha and liquid. And so because it transforms into two different things, it by definition cannot have the same composition. So it's an incongruent melting material. And so part of the reason I wanted to bring up a, a lot of these um, uh, things as review is because we're gonna see corollaries to them in ternary phase diagrams, but I want you to be familiar with what they look like in binary and unary systems before we get to that.